A sermon for the first Sunday in Lent, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted forty days and forty nights, and afterward he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels charge of you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Thus far the word of the Lord our God. Dear Redeemed, it's opposite day for the second Adam in our gospel lesson, that is, for Jesus in the reading from Matthew. The first Adam got a lush garden with all sorts of fruit trees. The second Adam gets the wilderness and scarcity. The first Adam's menu said, all you can eat. The second Adam is fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. The first Adam had Eve as a companion because it is not good to be alone. But the second Adam is alone. Well, almost. Satan is there in the wilderness, just like he was in Eden. In fact, while it looks like opposite day from Eden in every other way, here's what Eden and the wilderness have in common. Satan is there, doing his usual act of tempting. His temptations have led to the world turned from garden into wilderness in the first place. He's still around in our gospel lesson, and he's pretty much using the same temptations that worked so well the first time in the Garden of Eden. When Satan approached Eve, he put her focus on the one thing that she couldn't have, fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She could be full and satisfied every day, all the time, from all the other available food. So he pointed her to the forbidden fruit, Does it really have to be this way, Eve? Why not eat from that tree too? Why don't you look after yourself? Eve, who had everything, gave in to temptation. She repeated God's command, but then broke it anyway. On opposite day in the wilderness, circumstances are far different. Jesus is fasting for 40 days. He's hungry. But it's a chosen hunger. Food is scarce in the wilderness. But this is no problem for Jesus. As the Son of God, he can turn stones into bread with a word. So the tempter comes and reminds him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. In other words, it doesn't have to be this way. And you know it. You're the Son of God. What are you hungry for? Why don't you look after yourself? Jesus responds, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Like Eve, he quotes the word against the devil. Unlike Eve, he's not going to give in. It's opposite day. When Satan tempted Eve, he said, You will not surely die if you eat the forbidden fruit. It was a lie, but then Satan is always a liar. In effect, he whispered to her, You've got nothing to lose. 
everything to gain. Why do you think so little of yourself? You're Eve, after all. Do what you want. For this second recorded temptation in our gospel reading, Satan takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. How crafty of the devil to quote scripture at Jesus, just twisted to serve his ends. In other words, you will not surely die. Why do you think so little of yourself? You're the Son of God, and the Son of God doesn't die. Prove it. Show everyone that you can take care of yourself. You're Jesus, after all. You shouldn't die as the sinless Son of God, ever. Jesus responds, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Where Eve will not deny herself what she wants, Jesus does, because it's opposite day. When Satan tempted Eve, he said of the forbidden fruit, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, you could be so much more. You could be like God. Why stay in the place that God has put you if you can be and have so much more? In our gospel reading, Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, then says, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. In other words, you're the Son of God. You shouldn't be hungry in the desert with your eyes set on a silly cross. You could be so much more. You're not just like God. You are God. It's just that your Father's plan is holding you back. Why stay in the place that he's put you if you can have so much more? Eve wanted more than everything God gave her and ended up with worse than nothing. Jesus denies himself everything in order to accomplish his Father's will. It's opposite day. Throughout the entire temptation in the wilderness, the first Adam stood by in sinful silence you barely hear about him in the account of that temptation. God had given him his command, his word to preach. Instead, the first Adam shut up and fell into sin. The second Adam, suffering the hardships brought upon by the fall of the first, keeps speaking God's word and doesn't sin because man shall not live by bread alone, but man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's opposite day. But why? Remember when the temptation of Christ in the wilderness takes place. It is right after his baptism. Remember how strange the idea of baptizing Jesus was to John. How the Baptist tried to prevent it. His baptism was a baptism of repentance for sinners. And Jesus wasn't sinful. So why did Jesus demand to be baptized? To take his place among sinners. In baptism, their sins are washed off all of them. At his baptism, their sins were washed onto him. From his baptism on, Jesus' path is clear. He's on his way to death on the cross, bearing the sin of the world as his burden. And that's where the opposites begin. Sinners go into the water and come out forgiven. Jesus goes into the water and comes out marked as the sinner condemned. Don't forget, when Jesus undergoes this baptism, God the Father declares, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. This is the plan for salvation. Not only that, but the Spirit descends upon Jesus. And because this is part of that plan for salvation, it's the Spirit who drives Jesus into the wilderness. Since Jesus has taken his place among sinners in the Jordan River, he endures the wilderness, the poverty and the hunger, the thorns and the thistles that they deserve for their sin, because they had everything and lost it. He has nothing in order to gain back everything for them. Because they could not resist temptation, 
he resists it for them. Because they deserve death for sin, he dies to give them life. The temptation in the wilderness is not some oddity, just a funny thing that happened on the way to Calvary. The second Adam, Jesus, is undoing what the first Adam did. Where Satan won the round in Eden, Jesus hands him a stinging defeat in the wilderness. Because after 40 days and 40 nights of hunger and temptation, Jesus emerges from the wilderness as the sinless Son of God. And because he is sinless, he can still be the sacrifice for the sins of the world. On he goes from there, the sinless Son of God, bearing the sins of the world so that sinners can have his righteousness. It's all the opposite of what he and they deserve. And so it's opposite day for you as well. You're tempted all the time, and the devil uses the same old tired script it's quite the accusation that you still fall for the same old temptations. It may be a different time and place and object of temptation, but it still comes back to this. The devil whispers, does it really have to be this way? Shouldn't you take care of yourself? Why do you think so little of yourself that you deprive yourself of what you want? You're you, after all. Do what you want. You could be so much more. Why stay where God has put you, confined you, if you can be and have so much more? Pick a sin, and I'll argue it comes back to this. You're constantly tempted to look after yourself first at the expense of God and others. Think fourth commandment, thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother, which commands honor towards parents and all authorities. The evil one constantly needles you. Why do you do what authority figures say? Don't you know better than they do? You could be so much more if you just looked after yourself and did what you want. Ignore that curfew. Sabotage your boss. Make fun of your teacher. Keep your tax payment for yourself. Why do you let them keep you in that little box? Think fifth commandment. You shall not murder. Satan is twisting you up on this one, too. Why do you think so little of yourself when others hurt you and insult you? Why not strike back? Why not plot revenge? Why not bear grudges and delight when they get hurt? Why do you deprive yourself of the satisfaction of their discomfort? Does it really have to be this way? Think sixth commandment. You shall not commit adultery. And know that the devil is hard at work with this, too. Did God really say that you shouldn't fill your mind with whatever you want? Is it really fair that he says to flee lust? Does it really have to be this way, where intimacy is reserved for marriage? Shouldn't you be making the decision? It's your body, after all. Do what you want. Think seventh commandment. Thou shalt not steal. And throw in the ninth and tenth against coveting. The devil tempts, is it really fair that your neighbor has better stuff than you do? Don't you deserve to have better employees than your competition? Why do you deprive yourself of stuff that the company won't miss and isn't using anyway? Why aren't you looking after yourself better? Think eighth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. The devil whispers, are you serious with this thought of just taking the insults of others, of turning the other cheek? Don't you deserve better than that? If you don't defend yourself, who will? You're you. You're not like that low life who has slandered you. Shouldn't you give him a taste of his own medicine? We haven't yet mentioned the first three commandments, but that's the devil's real target. With every temptation, he asks, did God really say... And with every sin, he's got you following your will rather than God's. Every time he tempts you with, you're you and you deserve better, he's got you valuing your own name over the Lord's name. And with every temptation, Satan says, do what you want. That way you will be like God. If you never think along these lines, then you have no need for forgiveness. But whenever you put yourself first think you deserve more or take offense than others, or that others have a sweeter deal, 
you've already fallen prey to temptation. The curse of sin is for you. In other words, for your sin, you deserve deprivation and death. And that is why Jesus is in the wilderness. Opposite day is for you. You deserve deprivation, none of God's gifts and blessings. So Jesus is the one deprived even of bread in the wilderness. You deserve accusations and condemnation for your sin. Read through the accounts of Jesus' suffering and marvel that he takes all the accusations and doesn't defend himself because he's accepting them on your behalf. You deserve death for your sin, for imagining yourself to be like God. So the Son of God, under no illusions, goes to the cross and stays on the cross in your place. It's opposite of how it ought to be. That's the gospel. Never, ever think that forgiveness comes cheap. It is free to you, but only because Jesus has paid such a price. You grow cranky and feel cheated if you miss a meal. Jesus fasts and endures the hunger you deserve. You live a life with lots of nice things and you covet more. The King of Kings goes to the cross without home or possessions to give you the treasures of heaven. You're easily tempted to do whatever makes your eyes or your body happy. The sinless Son of God endures the scourge, nails, and cross on his body in your place. Forgiveness doesn't come cheap. It comes at the cost of Christ's own blood. But it comes. It comes to you by the work of the Holy Spirit in the means of grace, because it is God's will. It comes as the Spirit works through every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, proclaiming, washing, and feeding in His word and sacraments. Jesus has intentionally taken your place as the sinner who suffers and is damned by God in your place. He has suffered hell on the cross so that heaven is yours. Risen again, He comes to you with mercy and grace, not wrath and judgment. This is God's plan, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for your salvation. That's why he baptized you in his name. That's why he continues to provide his word and his supper. The temptation and cross are no accident, but God's plan so that you might live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. For every word that comes from the mouth of God is directed to tell you this truth that for the sake of Jesus, you are forgiven for all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the singing of the offertory. <laughs> 